Today, church, I want to begin a series entitled Seizing Our Relationships. How many of us know that our lives are tied to relationships? But often we live in such a selfish and self-driven society that we forget to cultivate the relationships that God has given us. So today, with that in mind, I want to call your attention to the book of Genesis. Today, I won't preach an expository sermon as I attempt to do most Sundays. But today, I want to address this subject matter about relationships in a broad way. And we pray that if you lend me your thoughts and your imagination, that you will see God throughout the sermon. Genesis 2, 18 reads like this. Then God said. It is not good that the man should be alone. That's enough. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I want to talk about this morning with the Lord's help in your prayers. I can't do life alone. I can't do life alone. Church, this immediate past week has been a week that has shook many of us at the very core of our existence. Many of us today, we're seated in the sanctuary, but we can recall last week vividly. Last week, many of us, after church hours, were going about our Sunday routine. Chilling, relaxing, some of us were on our way to Memphis for worship. When often our lives were interrupted by the unsuspecting news that Kobe Bryant and others' lives had been cut short in a helicopter crash. We were shocked. Many of our phones rang. We received text messages. We found out through social media or some news flash on a television. Kobe Bryant, the black mamba, age 41, along with his daughter Gigi, lives were cut short. But church, I remind us why we focus heavily on Kobe this week. There were others on that helicopter as well. Their names may not be in lights. They may not ever have a jersey that's hung in an arena. But their lives count and their families are mourning and grieving as well with the unsuspecting news, the, the, the uneventful, unfortunate news that their loved ones' lives had been cut short. Church, we saw all types of outpours of love. We saw fans that emerged on the house that Kobe built, makeshift memorials. We've seen tributes on social media. We've heard phone interviews and in-person interviews. We've seen sports icons and professionals and celebrities almost cannot control their grief because it was so shocking. But church, one interview that stuck out to me was on NBA on TNT. Shaquille O'Neal, former class, former teammate rather, began to express himself in an emotional way. He said, you know, we live, we go to work, and we do so much, but oftentimes we fail to do what we should just let go of. He was speaking from his heart, turned to his colleagues and said, you know, I don't call and check on you all like I should because I work an abnormal amount of time. He began to delineate how he works so much, and that's what we honor but it cuts him off from just checking on his friends. Church, I thought about that. Is that not us? Always moving, always pursuing, always looking for our next step of singular success, our personal endeavors and goals, and we find ourselves speeding down the highway of life, and oftentimes we never roll down the windows long enough to smell the roses of friendship and relationship. Who am I talking to? You, you're in a room full of people, but you'll bust out the door before we can say amen 
to get back in the fast lane of life. You see people that look familiar. I think I go to church with you, but you really don't know them. I'm guilty. I can't remember the last time I've been to a family reunion because I've done all my work in the name of God and failed to cultivate family relationships. Sometimes we say, I'm too busy to slow down. But we all need relationships. I know, wait, wait, wait. I know what you're saying. I, I invited you in my home study when I was writing this sermon. I said, what would the people think when I remind them that they need relationships? I know somebody say, Rem, I can't do people. That's what I don't do people. They too complicated. People just too messy. They ain't right. I, I, I would, but I, I don't do women, Reverend. Because you know, Reverend, I just don't get along with women. Reverend, I don't do men because men are threatened by me. I, I come to church, but Reverend, don't ask me to get involved in anything because I've been hurt. I've exposed myself to and shared my secrets. And all people have done is expose my vulnerability and shame me. Reverend, I don't do people. That's what we say. But church, before you lean in too close on your emotion, allow me to share with you God's design for our lives here. In this text, we have God who is the chief architect, contractor, and engineer of all humanity. And now we have God who has created the earth. And when we read Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 up to verse 18, everything God did, the, uh, the, priestly, the priestly editors tell us that he did it and he said it was very good. When he made the earth, he stepped back and said, that's good. When he made the sun, moon, and stars, he says, that's good. When he tacked it down with roses, dandelions, and daffodils, God says it's good. But when God begins to close out phase one of creation and he gets ready to make woman, he says it's not good. What a contrast. God goes from good and very good and now the text opens with it's not good. May I suggest to you this morning church, none of us should want to live in the it's not good zone. Literally God steps back and says it's not good for humanity to be alone. When you read this in the Hebrew it may read like this it's not good and it does man harm to be by him Himself. That's all I came to tell somebody is uh, God made relationships uh, so you can become your complete self. Literally, this is what this text tells us. Creation is incomplete until relationships are formed. And all I came to tell somebody today is uh, you may have a lot going on. You may look good on the outside. You may have hair like Ray even feathers uh, and a shape like a Coca-Cola bottle shape. You may have bulging biceps uh, and 2020 vision. You may be supervisor on your job uh, and have BA or MA behind your name, uh, but your life is incomplete until you have relationship with somebody else. Uh, Dr. C.A.W. Clark says it like this. Anybody that is self-made uh, is half made and your life needs to be touched by somebody's wisdom. Your life needs to be touched with somebody's encouragement and understanding so you can meet your full potential. This is the take home truth and I'm in my seat. God designed and provides relational opportunities for our personal and spiritual growth. I wish y'all were hearing me this morning. God designed and provides relational opportunities for our personal and spiritual growth. This is the deed to do. Take full advantage of the blessing of relationships, knowing they cultivate righteousness. I know you've been trying to cultivate righteousness on your own. You think righteousness is how well you dress. 
you think righteousness is knowing all of the Bible. But what good is it knowing the Bible, but you don't live out the Bible with people? I, I know you think righteousness is how well you can hold a prayer vigil in a prayer meeting, but maybe God says, after you pray, I want you to be the answer to your own prayers. And literally, God says, we cultivate righteousness within our lives, and we show that we are in right relationship with him, not by how we shout on Sunday, but how we live with people Monday through Saturday. And that's when you know that you have righteousness when you can lead in community and harmony with people and not take anything for your own good so there's three affirmations I think that we ought to lift out of this text when we realize that we can't do life alone this is the first thing today church is this I can't do life alone I need community let the church say community Listen, church, God is too powerful. God is too full of wisdom to waste time. God doesn't do anything out of season. That's us. So God, in his infinite wisdom, and he knew that we were going to need community, God established something called the church. In Matthew, he says, upon this rock, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. it. It's something interesting about this word church. This word church in the original language is ecclesia, which literally means to be called out, to be called into. Listen, God says this, our personal space is sometimes not good enough space for us to experience him so God says let me call you out of your own life and call you into community with other people so you can experience and grow in me let me put it where you can get it sometimes your personal space is too busy sometimes your personal space is too sinful sometimes your personal space is too toxic so God says let me call you out of your personal space uh, into sacred space uh, so you can uh, experience me uh, because sometimes my space ain't good enough so I can experience God L look at somebody say your space ain't good enough because how many of us know that sometimes our own space is so full that all we do is focus on ourselves? And if you're always focusing on yourself, it's hard to focus on God. Uh, uh, let me see how if I can put it where you can get it. My, my cousin today, we were talking on the way to church this morning. And uh, he said, cuz, I, I had been feeling sick. I said, well, what's going on? He said, doc, my, my body was just out of whack. I said, well, doc, have you been to a doctor? He says, matter of fact, I have. I said, well, what did the doctor tell you? He said, man, I thought I was sick. But really, what I was suffering from, I wasn't suffering from any critical ailment. I was suffering from vitamin deficiency, especially vitamin D. So my body started acting out of whack because it wasn't receiving the vitamins that it needed. I thought about that. He was talking about his body. But I started thinking about our behaviors. Many of us act out and act out of nature and out of self because we're not receiving the nutrients we need in community. And can I tell you something? Church is not one vitamin, but it's a multivitamin. And there are multiplicity of things that you can get at church that you can't get in at home. When you come to church, we celebrate the Lord's table. When you come to church, we witness baptism. When you come to church you hear a song that touches your heart when you come to church when you can't pray for yourself you trust that somebody else is praying for you when you come to church tears can be streaming down your face and it can be somebody across the room and look at you and just tell you hang on in there look at your nature and say neighbor there's a tactile nature in the church there's something touchy about the church it's something about when we hold 
hold hands and pray that we feel God's power that you can't feel on the internet. It's something about fellowship. When you see somebody that you haven't seen before, look at somebody and say, I need your touch. I need you and you need me. We're all a part of God's body. I wish y'all take the brakes off me. That's why the psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Is there anybody here that can testify you went through some stuff this morning just to get to church? You went through some bad attitudes to get to church. You changed outfits two, three times just to get to church. Because you said, if I can get to church, things can get better. I can come to church with tears in my eyes, but before I leave church, I need believing that things can get better. When before I come to church, I shake my head in disgust about what's going on in D.C. But when I leave church, I trust that my power don't come from Congress, but my power comes from the Lord. Look at somebody and said, I was glad when they said unto me. I was glad when they said, enter his gates with thanksgiving and enter his courts with praise and be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good and his mercy endureth forever at church forsaken not to assemble yourselves one with another at church I know folk tell us we don't have to go to church to have a relationship with God. But I beg to differ, I need some restricted space. I need to come away from all the distractions of the world and put my mind on God. So forget about yourself and concentrate on him and worship him. There's another affirmation I need to give you and I'm, I'm soon in my seat. I need community. Are you thinking with me, church? And not only do I need community, I need connection. After community, the next proper step is connection. Many of us settle to be in space, but we're not connected to anybody. I, I know we live in a world where we act like we have connection, but we really don't. Many of us, we have thousands of Facebook friends, and we still really don't have anybody at all. Many of us, we work in crowded spaces, but we can be in a crowded room and still feel like the only person in the room. Many of us, we put up all type of posts augmented additionally with a portrait of ourselves and we always catch ourselves in the best light using the best filter to block off the blemishes in our lives but after we do all that and we look whole we still find ourselves in the pit of depression and that's a sign that you can have a whole lot going on and still not have any real connection. People know your name, but you don't have connection. People know where you live, no connection. They know your title, you are perceived to be successful. But sometimes even with success, all you have as company is your own conflicted thoughts and emotions. But Jesus lets us know how important connection is. Jesus often found himself in crowds and multitudes. And after the crowds and multitudes, Jesus had a group called the 12 disciples. 
where they turned the world upside down in three and a half years. But even after the disciples, he had a family at Bethany. Mary, the worshiper. Martha, the worker. Lazarus, his friend. And when Jesus just wanted to kick back and not be Jesus, the miracle worker. And not be Jesus, the caterer for a hungry multitude. Jesus would slip off at the house of Bethany and just hang out with his boy Lazarus, Mary and Martha. Can I park there for a minute? Everybody needs some connection with some people where you don't always have to be on. You, you don't always have to be supervisor. You don't always have to be mother or father. They just take you for you with your blemishes and all. Does anybody need a family at Bethany where you can just unload and not worry about how people look and think and analyze who you are? But then after that, there was another more intimate group. Jesus had Peter, James, and John. This was the crew that he would take in with him when he would perform miracles. When his back would be up against the wall. And listen, we all need connections for certain moments in our lives. If you're not too mean, just look in somebody's direction and say, neighbor, you need connections for certain seasons. Because Jesus had this connection with these boys on the seashore. Let the church say the seashore. This was a purpose moment when God was getting ready to do a great purpose in their life and his own life. And listen, you need people in your life that can handle your purpose. And not only handle your purpose, but push you closer and deeper to your purpose. You, you don't need silly people around you when you're trying to do purposeful things. You don't need people pulling you away and distracting you when you got deadlines and when you need to go back to school and finish assignments and realign yourself. You don't need people who don't have purpose already on their lives while you're trying to pursue your purpose. Oh, they were there at the purpose moment. But then they were there at the Mount of Transfiguration. The Mount of Transfiguration is when Jesus was transformed in power, glory, and radiance. And who was there? Peter, James, and John. Can I tell you this? This was a high moment. And listen, can I tell you something? Everybody can't handle mountaintop high moments. You know, when you're on the mountain, the air is thinner. And you don't need people sucking up your air when God is trying to lift you up. You need some people that can be happy when God is doing a great work in your life. You need somebody that can push you and not try to hog the spotlight because they are jealous and envious of you. You need some Peter, James, and John that can handle some mountaintop experiences. You know some people only like you when you're on the plane and some some people only get happy when you in the valley, but I need somebody that can handle Mount Transfiguration. I know you don't got people like this. Some people, as long as they helping you, they okay. But when you start helping yourself, they start getting indifferent. When you start helping yourself, they start having sly and slick remarks. I need somebody that can handle the high moments. But, but can I tell you this? Not only is there the seashore, not only is there the Mount Transfiguration, but there's also Gethsemane. Gethsemane is the garden where Jesus prayed. And who was there with him? Peter, James, and John. They had their flaws and they fell asleep. But they were there. And I know y'all got a problem with them because they fell asleep outside of the garden. And I ain't too messed up about them falling asleep. But sometimes when you're at Gethsemane, the crushing place, sometimes you just need somebody around you. And I need somebody that can help me by their presence in my low moments. Gethsemane is a place where you say, Lord, I want to get out of this. Lord, let this cup pass from me. But if you got the right 
people in your circle. You can move from saying, Lord, let it pass from me. And you'll move, not my will, but your will be done. Shake somebody's hand and say, neighbor, I need the right people with me. Yes, they may have flaws. And yes, they may have some inconsistencies. But if you can handle purpose, if you can handle my high moments, and if you can handle my low moments, come on, baby, you can roll with me. Look at somebody say, you can roll with me. If you can handle them three, you can handle everything else in between. I'm done today. Y'all tired. I need community. I need connection. I can't do life alone and grow into Christ likeness. I've been trying to get here all day. Church, when we settle to live in isolation, it's easy for us to spiral into selfishness and narcissism. When you always by yourself, you think life is about you. You start thinking that the sun rises and sets on you. And I, I know that's how people live, but that's a small way to live. That's a narrow way to think that you can't ever be happy unless you're at the front. You're a sad person today if you have to be the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. That, 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 that's, a, that's, a, that's the wrong way to live. Because God oftentimes works out our sanctification in relationship with other people. I know you think being set aside for God's purpose, that's sanctification. You think it's all in how well you sing. No. You think as if you can quote all the Bible. You think that's sanctification. You think if you wear the right color on the first Sunday, that's sanctification. You think sanctification is how good you speak in tongues. And when somebody speaks to you, you return and say, praise the Lord. I'm blessed and highly favored. But real sanctification is when you learn how to live with other people, even in chaos and complexity. That's when Christ's likeness is revealed in your life. And there's too many times that Christ wants to reveal his likeness in our lives but when things start getting challenging and when things become complex we start backing away maybe you missing the opportunity for Christ to be revealed in your life because every time it gets tight you run off you say you don't have time. I, every year, I ain't got time for people. That's your new, your new Year's resolution. It's just me, 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 mine, I. In 2020, I ain't worried about nobody else. No. God may be keeping you in some situations because he's trying to reveal his son in your life. And I know we don't like this, but sometimes that's why God keeps some of us in marriage. Because he's trying to get glory out of our lives. I know you don't like this. I know you don't like this, but I got to shepherd you today. Don't get married so you can be happy. No, if that's the reason why you want to get married, don't do it. Because somebody can testify that you ain't going to always be happy. But marriage is the opportunity for us to reveal Christ-like character. Because when you get married, you got to forgive when you don't want to forgive. You got to put their needs before your needs. And you got to resonate Christ-like character when you marry. So if you want to get married to be happy, don't do it. I know you don't like that. 
because maybe God has you married not to make you happy, but to make you more holy. I, I, I'm done. Maybe God wants you in a life group so you can grow in spiritual maturity and you stop judging your life like it's a mess up because when you in life group you realize that there's people in church that's just like you and they struggling but at least they struggling with God maybe God has you on the job just not so you can climb the ladder of success and be engaged in work place politics but maybe God says instead of you pushing yourself first maybe you need to extend the helping hand to somebody else that's lagging behind maybe God wants you to have a relationship with the elderly person so you can stop looking at every relationship for reciprocal benefits but God wants you to be in relationship with somebody that you can pour into them and not look for anything in return God puts up in relationship look at somebody shout relationship but let me tell you this and I'm done but when you in relationship it's hard when you in relationship sometimes you deal with stuff that you're not even the author of you don't believe me, do you? Come here, Mrs. Joe. Come talk to me. When God let Satan touch her husband's life, God never said, have you considered Mrs. Joe? He said, have you considered my servant Joe? And God removed the hedge and let Satan touch Job's life. But because God was touching Job's life, it also affected Mrs. Job. It wasn't just Job that lost his cattle. Mrs. Job did too. It wasn't just Job that lost his house. Mrs. Job lost her house too. It just wasn't what Job that lost his children. Sister Job had to stand at the grave too. And sometimes when it's storming in somebody else's life, you'll feel a little rain too. Look at somebody and say, neighbor, when you in true relationship, when it rains and storms in somebody else's life, it'll rain in your life too. But don't you turn your back on your relationship. Hang on in there. Because when you read chapter 42 of Job, they got more cattle. They got another house. And God gave them some more children. All I'm trying to tell you is don't miss your relationship back and out of some relationships. Have I got a witness here today, church? Look at somebody and say, neighbor, I know it's hard. I know it's tough. But tell them why you're hanging on to your relationship with others. Don't forget to maintain your relationship with the Lord. Have I got a witness? I believe David knew something about that. When he said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley, of the shadow of death I fear no evil relationship for thou art with me thou art and thy stand shall comfort me thou prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies thou anointest my head with oil my, my cup runneth over. Surely, 
That's all I've been trying to get to today. Surely, 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 goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Shake somebody's hand and say, neighbor, you're not alone. No, never alone. He promised never to leave you. No, never alone. I wish I could put my arms around you today. I wish I can get you where you sitting at today. But since I can't get to you, and since I can't put my arms around you, put your arms around yourself and say, I'm never alone. He walks with me. And he talks with me. He tells me that I am his own. No, never, no, never, no. I know you feel like you're by yourself. Put your arm around somebody and say, neighbor, you come too far. He won't leave you. No. 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 He won't leave you. He won't leave you. Ah, he won't leave you alone. He won't leave you alone. Ah, he won't leave you. Do you believe it? Will you help me close it? Do you believe it? If you believe it, shiny eye, shiny eye. The doors is open. No, never alone. No, never alone. Sometimes your back is up against the wall, but you're not alone. Sometimes you're in your car and you don't have no passengers, but you're not alone. Sometimes you drink tears for water, but you're not alone. Yes. Yes, 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 can't nobody do me like Jesus. Come on, put your arm around somebody and tell them, can't nobody do you like Jesus. Tell them, can't nobody walk with you like Jesus. Can't nobody hold you in the midnight hour like Jesus can nobody dry your tears like Jesus nobody 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 do you feel like I feel do you feel like I feel as your neighbor neighbor 
do you feel? Tell me I got a feeling that everything. Oh! 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 